ahead. Yeah, okay. I think uh, I've been here for the last 20 years, and so um, there's nothing much to add, I guess. Uh, can I go ahead and start? You can introduce Adam. Okay. Right. Introduce yourself, Pons. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Selvarangan Ponazagan. People call me Pons. Um, I did my postdoctoral training in Indianapolis before I came to UAB, starting my first uh, job as an assistant professor. Uh, when Dr. Jay McDonald was the chairman here, I came with a CV Hello. of 200. Sorry. It's like my uh, internet not working today. Um, so uh, it's, it's okay, Adam, I, I'm just talking a little bit. Uh, then um, uh, I stayed put uh, ever since I joined UAB, uh, rose uh, in the ranks, and now I'm a professor in the Department of Pathology. The major area of the research in my lab are uh, on prostate and breast cancers. And we also do some work in uh, bone diseases, mainly in non-union fractures. I've been funded uh, by NIH, uh, DOD, and uh, Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation um, in the past. Uh, I published more than 115 papers as of now. Um, today, I will uh, talk a little bit about the work that we've done in the last uh, few years on uh, TNF receptors involving both cancer and in um, uh, autoimmune diseases, mainly in inflammation. If that's good enough, I can continue with my talk. It's perfect. Okay, as you see, uh, thanks Adam for uh, uh, inviting me and also taking over the grand rounds. I've done this uh, before you for 14 years. We started out as uh, MCP seminar series, and then it became pathology grand rounds. Uh, I'm really happy that it's really going very well, and they've you know, introduced new um, ways of doing it also in short talks coming up. Uh, uh, today, as you see here, my the title of the talk is Modeling TNF Receptors for Osteolytic Malignancy and Autoinflammation. As the uh, first slide says, I don't have anything to disclose, so I'll just go with uh, the real scientific slides. As you can see, uh, the tumor necrosis factor receptor superfamily or TNF or SF are cytokine receptors that are characterized by the ability to bind TNFs via extracellular cysteine rich domain. This is what you see on the um, left side. I just get this basic point. Okay, left side is a prototypical TNF receptor membrane. Uh, member. So in the active form, the majority of TNF receptors acquire a primary complex, as you see here in the plasma membrane, and most TNF receptors contain also transmembrane domains. In addition to that, they have intracellular domain. Unlike some of the kinase receptors, they do not have enzymatic activity. So they, you know, involve or recruit adapter proteins to convey signaling mechanism. TNF receptors are primary involved, primarily involved in apoptosis and inflammation, but they can also take part in other signal transduction pathways involved in proliferation, survival, and differentiation. And TNF receptors are expressed in a wide variety of tissues in mammals, especially in uh, leukocytes, mainly because of their role in inflammation. So as I said, they perform a wide variety of function and they activate various signaling cascades as you see here which are involved in cell death or proliferation or even inflammation. Inflammation, which is the majority of uh, activation. One of the key transcriptional factors that get activated by TNF receptor, mainly TNF receptor one, is NF-kappa B, which again functions as a ubiquitous or very widely popular um, transcriptional factor regulating variety of gene expression. So if you see here, this is a broad, uh, overview of the TNF receptor family members. The TNF receptors, there are about 30, approximately 29 to 30 TNF receptors and about approximately 20 ligands. All the ligands form TNF super family members and they all have prototypical TNF homology domain as you see here in the green elongated structure with which they bind to the TNF receptors. The TNF receptors have unique cysteine rich domains or called CRDs which have transmembrane domain. The CRDs are the extracellular region, which you know, bind to the ligand, and the intracellular region conveys the message to adapter proteins. And there are few exceptions to these receptors which do not have intracellular domain, such as the trail receptor three, 
or OPG or osteoprotegrin or DCR3, which is a decoy receptor. They are secreted, especially DCR3 and OPG are exclusively secreted or soluble receptors, which function as decoy receptors to bind to specific ligands. And some of these ligands can bind to multiple receptors. And so similar to the um, checkpoint inhibition and um, immune activation of T cells, you can also see both positive and negative regulation of TNF receptor and uh, TNF ligand interactions. For example, 4NBB ligand, it is involved in T cell activation. FAS is involved in um, death, I mean, uh, inducing apoptosis in the tumor cells. So TRAIL is involved in you know, inducing DR1 or DR4 or DR5, which are TRAIL receptor one and two, which activate the caspase pathway leading all the way to apoptosis. OPG, on the other hand, is a decoy receptor. If it binds to trail, it prevents uh, uh, this uh, the uh, I mean uh, the rank ligand activity. So uh, uh, for the purpose of today's talk, I'll focus more on rank ligand trail interaction pathway and mostly involving OPG. How this decoy function can be exploited for cancer or osteolytic therapeutics. And in this study, we also identified something interesting, which allowed us to study more on the TNF receptor family functions itself. And there I'll you know, talk something about DCR3 and TNF receptor in general. So if you see a rank rank ligand pathway, um, as many of you are very familiar with this one, this is gaining more popularity, not just in osteoclast or bone homeostasis, but also in osteolytic as well as in um, osteoimmune functions during cancer bone metastasis. Rank ligand is a trimer, and all of these TNF receptors are trimeric membranes, once again, homotrimers. Similarly, the ligand, the ectodomain of the ligand is also homodimeric. And so the rank ligand binds to rank, which is a receptor of the TNF receptor superfamily. And once rank ligand binds to rank, it connects to uh, the you know, um, recruitment of the adapter proteins. Rank ligand is typically produced by T cells and osteoblast. And rank is present in a variety of uh, immune cells as well as in pre osteoclast. So, when, in addition to rank ligand and rank, what I mentioned before is osteoprotegrin, which is a decoy receptor produced by B cells, dendritic cells, and the stromal cells. So, the homeostasis of rank ligand rank interaction is regulated by osteoprotegrin because when rank ligand binds to rank, it stimulates mainly through the TRAF6 pathway to IKK and F NF kappa B, NFAT C1, and all the way to osteoclast specific gene expression. So if there is uncontrolled functioning of the rank ligand, obviously there'll be more osteoclast activation and uh, not being able to compensate it by osteoblast function. So the OPG functions as a very important decoy receptor in the normal homeostasis. However, in, so this is what happens in bone re, normal bone remodeling. However, when there is hyper osteoclast activity because of excess rank ligand production during osteolytic malignancy, unlike osteoporosis, which is age-related bone defect where osteoblast function goes slows down rather than osteoclast becoming aggressive. Whereas in osteolytic tumors, it is a little uh, reverse where rank ligand is produced in high amounts, not only by these cells, but also uh, osteolytic tumor cells, which allow hyper osteoclast activation and enormous amount of bone damage. Unfortunately, in this situation, not only rank ligand is expressed in high concentration, but OPG production is also diminished. So it's a double-edged sword, which really hurts uh, bone remodeling and resetting in um, hyper osteoclast activation and hypercalcemia and multiple uh, osteolytic manifestations. Some of the major uh, cancers which present with osteolytic malignancy are breast cancers, kidney cancer, lung cancer, prostate, and thyroid. Breast cancer, about 70 to 80% of the patients with breast cancer have osteolytic component. It transcends the type of subtype of breast cancer and mostly the receptor positive cancers are much more osteolytic rather than even T and BC. So uh, what is, how to balance this function? So there are few uh, molecules or 
you know, biologically driven as well as uh, synthetic molecules that are currently being used for limiting the osteolytic or osteoclast rank like and mediated function. One is bisphosphonate, which almost all of you know, it is not only used in um, uh, osteoporosis patients, but also is being used in patients with osteolytic malignancy. So bisphosphonate, there are always down um, effect of bisphosphonate, such as osteonecrosis of the jaw, and as well as osteoblast toxicity. So in the recent times, Dinosumab, which is the rank like an antibody produced by Amgen, is very popular and uh, it's being used in both in um, uh, severe osteoporosis as well as nostalgic malignancy. However, Dinosumab also has situations of osteonecrosis of jaw or infection of abdomen and urinary tract, pancreatitis, musculoskeletal pain, hypercalcemia. And OPG-EFC, so since I said initially OPG is a decoy receptor which can balance uh, the rank like and rank hyperactivation, it was being tried initially. However, there are some limitations which top OPG-EFC in uh, produced also by Amgen in clinical trials because OPG is a double-edged sword, whereas it can inhibit rank ligand activation. At the same time, it also binds to TRAIL. TRAIL is a death receptor uh, ligand. So it prevents apoptosis of tumor cells while it can restore you know, skeletal homeostasis. So at the same time, when you use a OPGFC as a purified protein, it is needed in a very high concentration, which is you know, going to the half-life. It's extremely expensive. And also there are secondary toxicities involved because of high amount of protein needed. Soluble rank is another form of you know, you know, bringing the balance, but it's not been exploited very well so far. So we thought in addition to uh, these things, how can we exploit the biological derivative, which is osteoprotegrin to make it more effective in function or in, um, uh, in uh, rank ligand hyperactivity. So, what we did was, okay, at that time, as I said, you know, OPG binds to trail and so it prevents the trail induced apoptosis. So this is one of the key mechanisms by which T cells uh, induce tumor cell apoptosis. Tumor cells, variety of tumor cells express trail receptors to DR4 or DR5, which is DR trail one or trail two. So how we can really modify the OPG or exploit the OPG without interfering in trail. That is this project we started a few years ago. So at that time, there is no crystal structure for OPG was available. So we did not know whether OPG, first of all, binds to trail and rank ligand using the same identical homology or identical domain, or is it a separate? So what we did was, however, we know, as everyone knows in this field, that TNF superfamily receptors all have conserved domains, both in the ligand and in the cysteine-rich domains. Most of them are highly conserved. So we just use this. If you see here, this is a cysteine-rich domain, as you see on the right side, CRD1 to 4, which is present in rank, but DR4 or DR5, which are trail receptors, you only have three cysteine-rich domains. These are highly repetitive and uh, enormously conserved, not 100% conserved, there's a lot of con degrees of conservation. So we tried to use this conservation as a model to potentially identify if there is any variation between OPG and rank uh, uh, OPG binding to rank like an untrained. So, so the CRD2 and 3 are mostly involved in ligand binding interacting interaction regions, actually. So we use the TNF receptor crystal structure as a template for modeling OPG. So initially, we use the structural homology structural modeling to identify potential uh, domains which could interact between OPG and trail. So as I said, rank ligand, which is shown here in blue ribbon, and trail, which is shown in the brown ribbon. Both of them are TNF receptor superfamily members. So when you use this homology building up modeling, it is not really based on crystal structure since we do not have uh, OPG crystal structure solved, but the crystal structure of these two molecules were available. So we tried to use to identify specific domains if there is any variation in potential interaction with OPG that is shown in green here. In our this homology modeling model building, we identified based on uh, this is only the trail that you see here in, in uh, uh, brown, 
So the trail receptor or rank ligand, both of them have two anti-parallel beta pleated sheets that form as a scaffold using which the adjoining domains interact with their ligand. So here, based on our homology modeling here using the UCSF Chimera and Put program, we identified five to six potential amino acids which could interact with trail, whereas these domains or these interacting domains were not present in rank ligand. So just as, okay, so then what we did was we use this osteoprotegrin uh, and then we mutated them individually. These are all the original sites of amino acids which we presume to potentially interact with uh, trail and mutated them to either alanine or you know, glutamine or glycine as well. Uh, and also we made some other amino acid substitutions to make sure that it is not simply a single aliphatic amino acid substitution. So we purified individually all of them uh, using a cell system. Interestingly, this is this Y49R, which at that time we did not pay much attention to, always had lower amount of secretion. OPG is a secreted decoy receptor. So this is a supernatant you know, tested for the production of uh, OPG uh, following transfection of mutant plasmid constructs. So you can just remember this alone for the second half of my talk. So then initially we have to first make sure that the OPG or the mutant OPGs in fact inhibit rank ligand induced osteoclast function. That is the key that even wild type does. So here we did the osteoclast assay where raw cells, which are pre-osteoclast cells, when you induce them with rank ligand or stimulate them, what will happen? They undergo osteoclast differentiation. You see high amount of multi-nucleated osteoclast. However, if you use osteoprotegrin, either as a purified protein or uh, as a, you know, uh, uh, biologically driven transfected material, it should bind to rank ligand and inhibit osteoclast function. So if you see here, this is a control you know, a culture condition of you know, raw cells where when you add rank ligand, you can see the osteoclast production here. Whereas wild type rank ligand totally prevents it. That's not a surprise because wild type rank ligand function is what we wanted to retain in our mutants also, so that it does not affect rank ligand binding. So if you see almost all of these mutants have greater degree of osteoclast function inhibition property preserved. So that's fine. That is just no different from the wild type. But our next important thing is, this is just a quantitation of this. So the next important thing is to see whether trail binding can be abolished or is that abolished in these cells? So we use MDA, MB231 cells, which is breast cancer, human breast cancer cells which have the DR5 and they're highly susceptible to trail induced apoptosis. So we added trail plus minus OPG, either wild type or the mutant OPG to see whether this trail function can be blocked or it trail, uh, it cannot block. So here, when you see the control cells, when you add trail, there is significant amount of you know, um, apoptosis. So the cell death is you know, enormous here. Whereas when you use OPG wild type, Classically, as you all know, it also binds to trail. So this is exactly what we wanted to abolish, where if you just remove this trail binding ability, still this OPG will be able to, you know, uh, allow trail function. So if you see here, two of these or three of these had, had shown very enormous amount of abolish, abolishment of trail binding. So potentially these uh, four of the uh, OPG mutants that we created look very nice for using without having trail inhibition interfered. So here, so we went ahead from this point onwards, we just started using this OPG Y49R, which had a, and a higher significant significance in terms of uh, retaining rank ligand function, but abolished in trail function. So, and then, you know, we went back and just saw in the atomolecular organizational level, having known this particular amino acid change. And then when you superimpose once again, both wild type and the mutant, you can see a good connection between the OPG, which is shown in green and the trail versus rank ligand here. 
So the interaction allows this binding. However, when you just break this, especially the Y, the tyrosine residues, as you see in Y49R, it totally you know, uh, loses its interaction with osteoprotegrin. That is only a uh, rank ligand. So when you superimpose both of them together, it retains back. So this gave us new hope or more hope that this osteoprotegrin variant could be used for uh, uh, therapeutic purposes. So what we did was uh, we first characterized in vivo, this is fine in vitro, in vivo, this is still functional. So we resorted to identifying some models initially uh, which will have very high, good amount of osteolytic pathology. And similar to breast cancer, myeloma, which is uh, a B-cell malignancy, also has high amount of osteolytic uh, activity. So we collaborated with Dr. Sanderson in this uh, project where um, we first tested what is the most ideal model of uh, multiple myeloma to check this OPG function, the Y49R. So we tested two different models. One is the BALPC MPC11. Initially, we were interested in uh, immunocompetent model uh, rather than immunodeficient model. Even though this model is pretty good in terms of causing bone lesion, but the severity is so rapid that within a span of two weeks, you can see enormous amount of tumor accumulation in the bone and destruction. So this may not allow for a therapeutic window, especially when since we are not using purified protein to just you know, add in a high concentration right away, but using a gene transfer approach to you know, produce the OPG in a physiologically relevant manner. So we also tested at the same time, Dr. Sanderson's lab several years ago, you know, developed a cell line called CAG with high amount of heparinase or overexpression of heparinase that also allows these cells to grow very efficiently in the bone. So in these cells, similar to this, they also introduce very in a strong amount of osteolytic component, but there is enormous spacing in terms of uh, window. It takes about more than four weeks to show reasonable or good amount of osteolytic component. So this is good for us to test our uh, gene-based uh, therapeutics here. So what we did was instead of directly injecting the DNA or you know a vector containing this osteoprotecting variant, which could you know allow or lead to uh, constant production perhaps will result to result in uh, osteopetrosis type of condition. So we wanted to have it a one shot approach at the same time, it will have not other consequences such as, you know, creating osteopetrosis. So we use a mesenchymal stem cell as a payload here as a genetically engineering cell therapy approach where we used a recombinant AAV to deliver this osteoprotein gene with you know, the variant or the wild type as a control, and then develop this model and transplanted this MSCs by tail vein injection to uh, you know, form to the sites where there is tumor or in the bone and see whether that can reduce uh, bone lesions. So here, in addition to, you know, this is just not the bone, here we are not interested or we were not interested in killing of the tumor cells, but only to correcting the bone phenotype. So when you see here, we also noted that when you use this OPG, whether it is a wild type or the mutant version, there is also a little bit lessening of the tumor burden. I'll come to that next. But here, the take home message here, when we did the micro CT analysis, there is enormous amount of restoration of the bone architecture compared to the untreated animals, both in the uh, uh, femur, or in the tibia and in the spine. So these are all bone parameters, basically the connectivity density, trapecular number and trapecular spacing correlating to what you see in the micro CT. And this is osteoclast activity by trap staining of both tibia and spine, where when there's no treatment, there's a hyper osteoclast function that you can see in the purple, dark purple. Whereas when you use, this is just a control mouse without any tumor challenge, but whether it is wild type or the mutant, it is really, uh, significantly reducing the amount of osteoclast activation. So for this, it's only a, you know, a referendum that the mutant osteoprotegrin can function just like a wild type in terms of bone restoration. So this is good, but the next is to I use or exploit this for therapeutics where we can just still induce uh, a trail function without affecting it, just like how the wild type does or uh, unlike the wild type test. So here, when we saw the amount of tumor also getting reduced in our 
uh, imaging, we also realized, as other studies have also started to show, that rank ligand function in not only you know osteoclast activation, but also in the pro inducing proliferation by of the tumor cells. It could happen either in a paracrine manner, that is rank ligand produced by other cells, or in an autocrine manner, because most of these tumor cells or the osteolytic tumors uh, produce a lot of rank ligand. So if you see here that this is this is what we saw when you just provide with rank ligand, there is significant increase in tumor cell proliferation. However, when you use OPG, it does not bring down entirely because tumor cells do not use only rank ligand as a means for you know, proliferation induction. However, whatever rank ligand was able to just increase, that amount was decreased when the OPG was you know, used, this mutant o OPG because you know, it sequesters the rank ligand. So obviously, you know, this is signaling, when we just saw what types of pathways are really involved, if you see the uh, NF-kappa-B pathway and Merck and uh, PA3 kinase pathway, P44, are involved, which is decreased significantly just to the level where there's you know, no rank ligand when OPG was treated. And then the next and the important thing we wanted to do was how this can be exploited both in terms of you know, restoring the bone damage, but also in terms of inducing tumor cell apoptosis in a combination context, especially exploiting the lack of trail binding ability of this OPG. So we resorted to the BALPC model of uh, 41.2 breast cancer. So in this breast cancer model, interestingly, when we tested initially, just these cells are implanted. People who use this model know uh, well about this. So when you use orthotopically in mammary fat pad, these cells need to be removed once the primary tumor starts establishing. And interestingly, when we tested for the bone lesions in this model, even prior to seeing observing metastasis, we were able to see amount of you know, bone damage, which is significantly different from a controlled mouse. So that means the rank ligand produced by these tumor cells are sufficient to perhaps cause a very significant amount of you know, uh, burden on the bone. So this will be one of the good models that we can use. So here, in addition to the OPG, which is mutant OPG, from here on, I'll just use this OPG, which refers to OPG Y49R mutant that we use. And here, instead of using trail as a purified protein concentration, because the trail is also going to be produced by the T cells, we avoided trail at this point, but use an agonistic antibody to enhance the function of trail induction. So the MD5.1 is an agonistic trail antibody. So we use the same stem cell-based therapeutics. This is mesenchymal stem cells are based mainly as a cell therapy rather than regenerative uh, medicine or you know, not this MSCs are anticipated to form the bone. However, the MSCs are producing the OPG in systemically and physiologically relevant concentration. So when we use this either individually or in combination, this is the graph that shows the tumor alone that is without any um, treatment, but OPG decreases some amount of tumor, whereas MD5 strongly increases uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, and decreases the tumor volume compared to even OPG. However, when you use the combination of these two, clearly there is a significant difference between just individual therapies and the combination treatment. So this is because as I was telling you, OPG is not really totally tumoricidal, but rank like an induced effect is totally blocked. And that's where you see lessening of the tumors. But when you target an adjuvant setting, by trail, it's not the only one thing that we can do, but this is initially we were interested because we were able to abolish the trail binding function of the OPG. So this is just like a you know, histopathology, uh, just to show how the control mice, the normal bone architecture here, you can see this is trichrome staining where you can see the green, you know, the uh, bluish green area indicates the trabecular and the cortical bone. This is the growth plate, but when there is no therapy following tumor challenge, there is enormous loss of the bone here, both in the trabecular area as well as in the cortical area. So, and then the next one is OPG alone. Interestingly, as you saw here, there is not huge difference between uh, this and this. However, this somewhere in the, is in the middle where the tumors are still growing, as you see here. However, 
OPG was able to restore reasonable amount or you know, un, almost comparable to that of the wild type in the bone architecture. Whereas if you use the MT5, which is an agonistic antibody for trail, it alone does not prevent bone loss. Although this is able to reduce the tumor burden because of direct you know, induction of apoptosis. So this is a very good combination based on this data that OPG can restore more on the bone function while also decreasing some amount of uh, you know, rank ligand induced uh, tumor cell proliferation. At the same time, MT5 can be a direct targeting for the tumor cells. So, and then we also wanted to see since rank is not only present on uh, pre osteoclast but also on multiple macrophages and other immune cells, we wanted to see whether OPG does any osteoimmune functions. That is not just the osteology function that we know it does, but does it also induce some reversal of immunophenotyping in the tumor microenvironment? So what we did was we used the mice which were given only OPG treatment and compared that to the wild type mice, which I mean not wild type, the mice which are not given any treatment, the controlled tumors, and then isolated the tumor cell lysate in the tumor microenvironment because this obviously has not only the tumors but also infiltrating immune cells as well as stroma, stromal cells. We didn't do any single cell assay, but we just used on the entire tumor microenvironment and did a cytokine array. This is actually the results of the cytokine array. I can, this, this is a brief, uh, one of the blots that shows that when you use the OPG alone, there is a significant increase in IL-16, IL-1 beta, IL-1 receptor antagonist, as well as some of the chemokines. You know, IL-16 is involved in some of the TH1 function. It induces, it is present, you know, T, CD8 T cells, they store IL-16. It expresses or induces expression of MHC class two. So these are all the immune functions which favor anti-tumor activity. Similar to then IL-1 receptor antagonist is also involved in decreasing metastasis through, you know, suppressing VEGF and IL-8 levels. So interestingly, IL-1 beta is a little, different because it also is supposed to increase rank ligand. So even though it is high, it is probably because OPG is decreasing the rank ligand activity. So is there any negative feedback? So we did not go into much detail at this point to figure out why it is, but this is an interesting combination that we saw. In addition to important chemokine, chemokines that attract uh, T cells and myeloid cells, which are anti-tumor to the tumor microenvironment. So this clearly indicates that OPG, the Y49R, not only just facilitates restoration of the bone architecture, but also in the tumor microenvironment, since it's a systemically available uh, molecule, you know, enhances signals for TH1 activity. So if that is true, there should be IL-16 is produced more by M1 macrophages. So when we saw that we wanted to look into seeing whether there is a change in the macrophage polarization or the number of you know, M1 versus M2 macrophages. So if you see just these two groups, there is a significant decrease when OPG Y49R was used in M2 macrophages, which are more uh, you know, immunosuppressive. And also we saw in a combination treatment there is a significant increase in CD8 T cells. I mean, this CD8 T cells, it's total CD8 T cells. They are not characterized based on a specific breast cancer antigen, but that's a clear indication that the anti-tumor functions were uh, you know, enhanced by increased number of CD8 T cells. So if this CD8 T cell activities were to be true, so we have to really test in a context where you can do an adoptive transfer so that establish uh, 41 tumor cells or the tumor in the mouse model and following which isolate T cells from the different treatment. And then if you use these T cells, if they are tumor specific T cells, they should destroy the tumor cells. So this is what exactly happened. You see here, the control mice so at the same time here, since you know, there, is, there is no tumor of the T cells from the control mouse, what we did was we just started from the normal mouse and also you know, used the different combinations treatments, either tumor alone or OPG, MD5, or in combination. So significantly uh, highest amount of anti-tumor function was observed in adoptive transfer in this combination group.
And we also had some mice which did not develop tumors or had very small tumors in this combination treatment, as well as in you know, individual treatments alone. So we went to re-challenge these mice in the opposite side of uh, the opposite mammary fat pad. And these uh, mice, it is not that they did not develop from day one because all of them had tumors. However, the tumors were explanted to facilitate metastasis. So we, when we did that, the mice which had initially MD5 and OPG cons, you know, combination therapy, when we used that mice and re-challenged them, they still did not develop any tumor at all. Whereas a very few number of mice develop tumors in the MD5 treatment. So this seems to indicate that there is a very clear T cell mediated function anti-tumor activity in addition to OPG helping with uh, bone restoration. And most important or interesting thing that we noted in this experiment is, especially in terms of dinosumab and clinical context at this point, can OPG treatment or MD5 combination therapy prevent metastasis. So most of the metastatic patients who already have uh, tumor burden in the bone have both you know, bone uh, homeostasis loss or bone damage, severe bone damage, and also tumor in the other sites. But there are some groups of you know, patients where they are pre-metastatic. However, they are amenable for aggressive metastasis down the road. So during that combination, what we did was to check whether when we remove the primary tumors, and allow metastasis during that time, before even waiting for the metastasis to show up, can we give this treatment and see whether it prevents metastasis? So if you see here, these are the naive mice which do not have uh, you know, any treatment, there is significant amount of metastasis. However, in the combination, almost 80% of the mice here did not show any tumors at all. This is pretty uh, interesting to us because in a recently concluded uh, clinical trial data, a huge multi-center data that is published in Lancet of 2020, where when they tried the adjuvant dinosubab in early breast cancer, uh, in both in neoadjuvant and in adjuvant context, on about 389 centers in over you know, 35, 39 countries in total, whereas you know, the entire study consisted of close to 4,500 patients equally dividing into the control or a placebo group and the dinosumab group. And this study concluded about one fourth or one little over one third of these patients are from United States. It spans Europe, Australia, Asia, and, uh, and the entire North America, North and South America, in fact. So the conclusion was it did not improve disease-related outcomes for women with high-risk early breast cancer bone metastasis-free survival and was not significantly different between the groups. So. It could be because that the dinosumab, when you use it, it is used in a very high concentration. It is extremely effective when there is you know, significant amount of bone damage. Whereas in this gene-based approach or you know, uh, biological approach directly, the amount of OPG that is produced, we measured the amount of OPG systemically produced, it's about 60 picograms per milliliter, 60 picograms. Whereas when we use dinosumab, in an amount of about 15 grams, we use about 200 micrograms of dinosumab, which is about more than 10 million fold extra. So whether the advantage is because the amount of OPG produced is in a systematic, systemically relevant and physiologically relevant context where in the body, when the cells that produce OPG naturally, the dendritic cells or the B cells or the stromal cells, they don't produce in enormous concentration, but in a very, very, limited amount that is enough. At the same time, the advantage is, is that they keep on producing in a sustained manner rather than having to worry about the half-life. So we thought that this may be one of the reasons why this therapy is perhaps more effective in preventing metastasis, in fact, in um, addition to just you know, doing efficacious uh, effects in um, bone remodeling of the advanced disease. So that's, that's where we are. Now we have this trying to use this in different combinations, not only involving trail function, but having realized that this OPG, mutant OPG can be a good combination. We are trying to use this in com combination with uh, checkpoint inhibitors, as well as using uh, GR1 inhibition for myeloid suppressor cell function. So just moving on to the other half of the talk, I initially said that you know, of these mutant types, this is the only mutant tyrosine 1, tyrosine 49, Y49 that we saw had very less 
amount of extracellular production. So the, all of them have very you know, significant amount comparable to that of wild type, whereas Y49 R alone had significantly less amount of protein production in the supernate. This osteoprotein protein obviously is a uh, soluble receptor which does not have intracellular or uh, you know, transmembrane domain, and so everything needs to come out. So how, why it is? So we were a little interested in seeing, although this did not inhibit the function of the osteoplast inhibition, the amount is always reduced. So we were really trying to see how and what could be the potential mechanism. So first thing is we saw the OPG in multiple species, as you see on this, this list, and this Y49, or even though this, you know, the members of the TNF receptor superfamily are highly conserved, excepting the cysteine domains, the cysteine rich, the cysteine domains which allow, you know, important functions of folding, this Y was invariably conserved almost in every species. That is really interesting for us. And then since OPG is also a member of TNF receptor family, we next checked the proteins, uh, primary amino acid sequence of various TNF receptor family members, not just the OPG in multiple species, but just other TNF receptor family members. Interestingly, this analysis shows here, like you know, we did not do all 19 of them, but some of the major ones that are really involved in uh, uh, useful in pathological and physiological context. So when you see here, this TNFR1 is the TNF receptor, which is the major or the main one, and you have the multiple other things, including DCR3, which is another, and uh, the one, one of the two uh, secreted forms of TNF receptor superfamily and OPG as well. So if you see here, and we align them based on the sequences excluding the uh, signal molecule. So if you see here, interestingly, this Y49R in OPG is also conserved in various other TNF receptor family members. When it is not conserved, the interesting thing that we saw was it was not replaced, it was present as an alternate aromatic amino acid, phenylalanine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan are, these, are the three benzene ring containing amino acids. So if in situations where there is tyrosine absent, we also saw presence of phenylalanine as a replaced version, not replaced version in, in uh, evolutionary significance. So this is pretty interesting. We also saw the same thing conserved in other, you know, uh, most of the other uh, regions where you saw the aromatic amino acids. So if you see here, this is entirely the uh, extracellular domain of the TNF receptor superfamily members. So they are, they can be grouped as CRD ones, this is cysteine rich domains, one, two, three, and four. At the same time, based on the structural configuration of the protein folding, the A1 are the modules in each CRD, which allows flexibility from the beta core. So that is ligand binding domain for interaction with specific or you know, uh, respective ligands. So when you see here, and this is what is highlighted in, the, in blue here, this is basically the cysteine, which is highly conserved just as everyone knows about TNF receptor super family members. So apart from this, this was a little bit more interesting for us to expand further to see, see if there are any mutations. If our Y49R had less amount of secretion into the medium, if there's a natural mutation, that should result in some pathology or some inflammatory uh, effect. So here, then we went into the uh, in fevers website, which lists a lot of inflammatory diseases, genetic diseases, to see whether there is any mutation which is naturally occurring in TNF receptor family, especially TNF receptor 1, because TNFR1 is more involved in inflammation than osteoprotegrin or DCR3. So here, we found this TNF receptor associated periodic syndrome, or what is called as TRAPS in short. It's, you know, this gene is located in chromosome 12, it's a rare multi-symptom genetic disorder characterized by unexplained periodic episodes of fever associated with symptoms of myalgia, abdominal pain, headaches, and skin rashes. So this is basically an inflammatory, it's a type of an auto-inflammation context where 
there is a prolonged amount of fever in these individuals, which comes as a significant you know, uh, pathological manifestation. It's not a lethal disease. However, the fever can prolong for a longer time. The only type of treatment people have at this time is uh, IL-1, uh, uh, yeah, IL-1 antagonist, or they use even non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to reduce the fever or periodic episodes. So TRAPS is caused by mutations of the tumor necrosis factor is called TNFR1A gene that encodes 55 kilo Dalton. There's also this 1B which encodes 80 kilo Dalton, but that is not involved in TRAPS as much. So TRAPS can occur randomly due to spontaneous mutation, or it may be inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. So defective TNFR receptor signaling, similar to what we saw, allowed for unchecked signaling of the ligand. So this is the main reason why there's prolonged inflammatory response leading to a uh, fever. And most of these mutations in TRAPS, almost about 60 to 70% of the mutations are all involved, or they involve cysteine mutations. The cysteine allows the disulfide linkage that's extremely important for the folding of this molecule. So almost invariably 70% of the mutations so far were on cysteine domain. So people realize that of course, uh, confirmation of this stability because of cysteine, loss of cysteine would be the reason why the inflammation is. However, there have been quite a few reports from clinical uh, studies, which did in the recent few times when this is not a lethal disease, so people do not do enormous amount of uh, gene sequencing here, but in the last couple of decades, there is more information where they've also identified non-cysteine mutations as a potential causative uh, reason for TRAPS disease. So this is some of this clinical manifestation as uh, patients with uh, TRAPS inhibit, relative, as you see, periorbital edema or the annular patch in the dermal region or this, you know, erythematous skin macules or patches that you see, and it goes away after some time following treatment with steroids or an you know, IL-1 uh, antagonist or even uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So our study from the OPG provoked a little bit more interest to identifying because we saw in the homology search that the F60, the F60 here is similar to Y49 in terms of sequence alignment, because if you exclude this you know, cleaving region, the alignment perfectly fits with F16. And then we use the structural modeling to see how this you know, compares to TNF receptor 11B, which is OPG. And Y49 is also highly conserved in the same domain in DCR3, which is the other secretor member of the TNF receptor superfamily. Interestingly, when we align these ectodomains, this F60 or Y49 seem to occupy almost identical place in terms of conformational uh, topology. And then we also looked into some of the additional mutations that were reported, which is non-system mutations reported in uh, TRAF disease. So if you see here, they not only span the CRD1 or the CRD2, which is more a ligand binding region that is system rich domain, they were also reported in CRD3, which is there, there's a deletion of one of the tyrosine residues. So CRD2, F60 was reported in more cases like to mutation to F60V and, and this, the original one, the mutant missense mutation. This is the only deletion mutation. So when we use this, that is three different system which domains, and then we independently try to model them. And when we saw them, in all three, irrespective of you know, A1 module in CRD1 or two or three, they all happen to have almost identical structural similarity, especially when this pertains to the phenylalanine containing amino acid. So we thought that this is something little interesting to study further. So is this phenyl ring or the aromatic structure important for the function of secretion? So we've modeled this TNFR function using the soluble versions or the secreted versions, which is OPG and decoy receptor 3 or DCR3. So this is the original one we used in our cancer context. As you see here, the amount, it is not because the expression level is low, because if the expression level is low, you should not see, you know, same amount or higher intracellular level here. So if you see here, this is a wild type OPG. So OPG being secreted 
predominantly you see the secreted form in the supernatum. Here, the, when they mutate the Y to R or Y to A, because we initially used R and then we even used a simple aliphatic amino acid, which is alanine. So either of them, when you replace them without or losing the tyrosine ring, there is significant reduction in the extracellular secretion. But the protein is retained intracellular. It is not because either degradation or expression level is inhibited. So when you see here, however, if this is true, what we did was we replaced Y with F, which is phenylalanine, which also contains the identical benzene ring as in Y. So when we did that swapping of amino acid, we were able to restore the amount of extracellular secretion. The same thing we saw also in the DCR, in DCR3. So DCR3 also has same mutation, I mean, a Y in 49. So when we replaced it with F, we were able to rescue the extracellular secretion level just like in wild type, whereas abolishment of this tyrosine ring totally prevents this uh, protein from you know, uh, translocating to the membrane and getting secreted out. And as I mentioned before, this did not affect the functioning of the light. So typically what we see in Trapp's disease, it is a prolonged fever. It is not like totally TNF receptor function is affected. Since the signaling is highly delayed, it constantly stimulates the NF-kappa-B pathway and leads to a uh, high amount of inflammation. So just like what we saw in the cancer initial study, we also tested in DCR3 whether, as I mentioned initially, DCR3 binds to fast ligand and prevents apoptosis. So when we use this fast ligand using jerked cells, you know, it was able to use, it is able to induce in you know, a significant amount of apoptosis, both in early, late, or total, depending upon, you know, propidium staining or annexin uh, staining here. However, when you use the wild type DCR3, it should and it did inhibit fast induced apoptosis that is similar to the you know, normal cells. This is induced with fast ligand. So when you use this DCR3 mutant, Interestingly, that also it decreased. That means the functioning is function of this ligand is not lost because of this mutation. And TNF receptor is the most important, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing that we wanted to see in this context because DCR3 and OPG are not associated with the disease, but that provided a good model to study how this TNF receptor could be rescued too. So this is the F60V, one of these mutants that is, you know, uh, being uh, that has been reported in multiple places in uh, inverse database in patients. So there is significant decrease in the amount of this receptor. This is not a soluble receptor, even though this receptor can be cleared and you can see in the systemic circulation, but most of it is, is present in inflammatory cells. But here we use uh, 293 cells to transiently transfect white type receptor, which nicely translocates to the, new, uh, the membrane, whereas when you mutate it with V, similar to what we see in clinical uh, context, there is reduction in the amount of, you know, the uh, mutant receptor translocating to the membrane. However, just like as what we saw in DCR3 and OPG, when we just substituted the phenylalanine back to tyrosine, where in those contexts we used tyrosine and substituted with phenylalanine, it rescued. Nonetheless, here, the thing is we were able to just restore the phenyl structure. So when we restored it, we are able to see similar to the wild type, that means it is rescuing the function. So that is a clear indication that the structure of this phenyl ring is very important for uh, the uh, signaling or the mobilization of this protein or protein processing work. So when we did this, we also did the functional assay where we stimulated the uh, cells transfected with either wild type or the mutant with TNF alpha and use NF kappa B as a readout. And as we saw here, when you use the mutant, the amount, what is, you know, the induction of NF kappa B is delayed, but it is more prolonged rather than in wild type, similar to what we normally see or what is reported in traps, traps disease where there is prolonged. So then we were more interested in understanding how this could be, what is the potential molecular mechanism. It's fine, it is somewhere, it is not getting displayed in the membrane. And we went into studying how this tyrosyl ring structure can form a crucial uh, role. So here, when you use this docking model and use this Y49 in DCR3, it very nicely interacts with not only 
amino acids in the A1 module, but also in the B2 module. See the B2 module or the beta pleats that you see here, they form a nice scaffold. So once you just abrogate or lose this one, this will result in loss of uh, stoichiometry or it will affect totally the protein folding. So then what we did was we used this uh, NMA with, to understand using the elastic network contact modeling the norm of the mo normal mode analysis to first identify, just use all these mutations, not only in TNF receptor, but also in the OPG, like what we created. This is not available in a genetic database or from the patients, but we try to compare both OPG mutants that we created and the ones which were rescued using alternate amino acid containing thiosyl group. So if you see here, the DCR3 OPG are the naturally occurring TNF receptor mutations that have been clinically reported along with the one that we created where we substituted F with Y. So when we see here, the vibrational entropy based on this elastic network contact model seem to affect clearly when there is a loss of this phenyl group. And using this vibrational entropy data, we also looked into the thermal stability, whether it can cause loss of thermal stability. So this, when it goes down in the negative, there is high of degree of instability of this molecule. So when we use this one, then we use the molecular dynamics simulation to see how this can really affect the stoichiometry of the molecule once the Y49, which seems to be very crucial in this interaction with the multiple domains, not only multiple modules, not only the A1 module. So when we remove that and try to use a, a molecular dynamic simulation, this is what happens. I don't know whether I can play this video. I'm, I'm not able to play this video, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, okay, that's fine. Um, I thought you know, this, this uh, interesting video that we developed based on this uh, structure, however, it's not working, so that's fine. So basically, it is clearly indicating to us that changes in the conformation really affects you know, the translocation. And then when you go to the intracellular compartment, what really happens? I think we're running out of time, I see Adam. So we, I'll just rush through in one minute or two minutes. Uh, we tested this by using this both mutant and or the wild type and see subcellular localization, we found that majority of them are retained in endoplasmic reticulum, which means probably it affects in the glycosylation process because, and then when we use this OPG Y49 R in a native gel, we also saw enormous amount of, you know, a streak um, number of uh, streak type of, you know, band rather than a sharp band, which is either it could be degradation or it could be incomplete glycosylation. So, since we also saw an ER retention, we you know we thought that it is more a glycosylated effect. So we use you know pegnase F to remove the oligosaccharides. So when you use that, all of them, this is all purified protein. Interestingly, it just drops down to a sharp band. So and this is again by tunicomycin. We use tunicomycin to block glycosylation. So what, everything is retained in uh, in the uh, in, internally rather than getting secreted out. So um, this is again, uh, the lectin binding assay to show that it's a, you know, polymanose is not really uh, used here. That's why the glycosylation effect. So next one is just to see whether we can rescue this phenotype where we just screen for some of the potential compounds which can, you know, mimic the tyrosine or this uh, phenyl ring and then use this molecular docking model to see whether in mutant TNF receptor, what we see in, in um, the clinical context, and it nicely fits in the cleft. So when this fits in the cleft, then we thought we can use this phenylephrine. This is typically like you know uh, epinephrine that is used as decongestant or even um, in uh, constriction uh, uh, defects. It is over the counter. So we use this phenylephrine at different concentrations and to see whether just using the same phenylephrine alone can rescue this even in you know, Y49A, which totally lacks. So when you see here, increasing concentration of phenylalanine, I mean phenylephrine, which is a mimic, seems to really work well in bringing up the levels in the uh, medium, which means that perhaps phenylephrine could also be used 
in the context to uh, you know uh, remove these inflammatory burden in these patients. We're just you know studying further using you know other variants that we are seeing here that has been reported in the clinical context and using the molecular modeling that they also seem to have a severe impact in the stoichiometry and when there's a deletion which is totally different than even a substitution mutation. So we are trying to expand on these studies and potentially create a knock-in mouse with this mutation and follow it up with how this inflammation can be dealt with and studied further. So that's the uh, uh, work that I want to say today. And these are the people in the lab who have contributed significantly to the work. And uh, Dr. Siegel, Sanderson, Tim Nagy, and Champion, they're all involved uh, in various parts of this work. And uh, these are the course that we really used in the entire study. This, you know, all the studies were funded by different institutions uh, without which I don't think anything would have been possible. Thank you. Sorry, I ran a little bit over. No, thank you, Pons. And I'm, I probably had a little bit to do with that with um, my uh, technical glitches. Thank you for taking over for me there. I switched to a different network. So hopefully this is more stable. Um, I know we are past the hour. So if you have to um, log off, please do. Um, but if you want to stay on, I see there's at least a few questions in the chat. Um, so those who want to stay on, please do. Those um, who have other meetings, um, hopefully I'll see you next Thursday. Thank you very much. So um, that being said, uh, Dr. Alexander really highlights the importance of your work, um, emphasizing the loss of a um, recent family member to metastatic breast cancer and continues on. Um, if you notice any differences in the tissue type of the breast cancer. What's that? Um, if you notice any um, differences with the tissue type of breast cancer. Uh, not really. Okay. And then uh, Doug has a little bit, uh, Dr. Hurst, would you like to uh, expand upon your question here? Or do you want me to read it? Yeah, I read it too here. In the metastasis prevention okay. study, it looked like the treated mice probably had micromets. I wouldn't call it as a micromets, uh, uh, Doug, because as you know, in our fluorescent uh, luciferous imaging, if you don't see any uh, signal, we try to up the amount of intensity. So when you up the intensity, even any mice, any mouse shows up spots. So we are not sure whether it is micromets, but we are sure that it is not micromets because over a long period of time, these mice never developed any tumors at all. Okay, uh, and thanks. Then, uh, thanks, Pons. And then Joanne asked, uh, do you see increased ER stress? Interestingly, I don't see much. We did only once about the ER stress. We are not very happy to conclude that it is not. That's why, you know, I just written a, uh, our own grant. We are trying to propose more to understanding the, uh, you know, whether it is ER stress or even other aspects of, uh, you know, uh, translocation in the Golgi is what is the context by which it goes to the Golgi and what happens to, uh, the molecules which are not glycosylated enough in a longer time. So at this point, we don't have a lot of data to say yes or no. Does manipulating TNF influence drug resistance? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I never looked into that. So, so Pons. Yeah. This is Ralph. I got a question for you. Um, so you did a little bit of work showing that this might, uh, your combination therapy might inhibit metastasis or forming yeah. of metastases. So are you speculating that this could be a maintenance type therapy? Yeah, it is not just a maintenance therapy because a lot of these patients who are like, you know, identified with the primary disease, they go on to new adjuvant and adjuvant therapy treatments, chemo and radiation combination. Yeah. And then when you use denosumab in that same time, does it prevent skeletal metastasis? It does not. So it, this probably could improve the potential of the adjuvant therapy in a context of the setting where these patients are definitely bound to have tumors down the road as metastasis. But these combination, existing combinations don't seem to prevent that. So that's where we feel it is more a prevention of metastasis or decreasing the metastatic load rather than, uh, you know, uh, prevention of the disease itself. Yeah, it just seems like, you, you know, you, you might have to have patients on the therapy for a long time. Uh, yeah, that's where we tried to use, you know, like a stem cell based approach where 
you are able to just produce constantly because missing common stem cells, unless they participate heavily into becoming bone, they stay as you know uh, stem cells. They are very quiescent. Yeah. And AAV does not even integrate, basically, the recombinant AAV. And so as long as the stem cell will have the potential to express this OPG for a long time, you yeah. should be able to have a systemic regulation. And the other thing is stem cells are, you know, you can do allergenic transplantation, which is not like, you know, you can get stem cells from anybody. And so it's much one of the, you know, a very powerful techniques, not only for bone or any other tissue regeneration, but also as a cell therapy platform. Yeah. So this needs to be tweaked in, but definitely there's potential to, and you can engineer the stem cells with an you know, virus or anything where they can stably express without having an AV vector system or which is transient. Yeah, okay, great. Great work, Hans, thank you. Thanks, Rav. Uh, great work, uh, Bons, uh, uh, this is excellent. You showed nicely, and this is a follow-up to Ralph actually uh, uh, question. Uh, nicely, you showed that uh, manipulation actually changed the environment to TH1 type, yeah, predominantly CD8, and and killing of the tumor as well as induction of bone formation. Um, a common uh, cancer where metastasis in bone is very common is lung cancer. Yeah, and is frequently treated by PDL1, and PDL1 is very important for actually in the environment and and also shifting um, the the immune environment to Th1 predominantly, basically because activation of cell that kills the tumor. So, do you think there would be like a synergy or antagonism between these TNF receptor manipulation and PDL1? It's a very interesting question, Elton. I just submitted a concept award for lung cancer DOD. I'm not a lung person, but based on this rank ligand potential. And we also identified that since rank does not only involve NF kappa B pathway, but also you know, uses the MAP kinase and the other pathway, P83 kinase, which are regulating PDL1 gene expression, rank ligand induced PDL1 can be activated simultaneously by tumor cells in an autocrine mechanism, as well as on other cells in a paracrine mechanism. So this could be a nice combination as long as you, know, you can prevent rank ligand activation signals, not only involving osteoclast gene expression, but also in other gene expression. So this can be a nice osteoimmune link for not just the bone, breast cancer. We use breast cancer as a model, but lung cancer, as you say, and the non, you know, small cell lung cancer, which is about 85%, about 40% of the patients, you know, show a bone phenotype. Nothing much has been studied there. So I just proposed a concept award. Uh, let's see how that is. We also have collaborated very uh, strongly with uh, Dr. Jesse Dishan, you know, Jesse, who is, uh, you know, in the pulmonology division. And we, we have multiple collaborations. We are planning even to submitting a multi-PA R01 with another person in biomedical engineering. So definitely there is huge prospects for this, not just in breast cancer. Breast cancer provided with a nice model because 80% of the breast cancer patients have bone um, you know, pathology. And so, you know, that was a good starting point, you know. Does it answer your okay. question? Well, thank you so much, Pons. Obviously, a lot of excitement around this um, and a lot of questions. Um, and the great thing is, is obviously um, you're on campus, so this discussion doesn't have to end here. Um, but it can end here for grand rounds today, at least. Um, oh, thanks, and I encourage everybody to uh, follow up with you individually. Sure, and uh, thank you again for the excellent talk. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for your time. And thank you for covering when my internet pooped out. Oh, <laughs> Hope I didn't mess it up. Uh, no worries. Bye. Stop video, how do you stop?